Welcome to the True Tone Lounge. I'm Zach Childs, your host. Today we are on Winford Drive in Nashville, Tennessee, which is the location of Exact Tone Solutions. Exact Tone Solutions is one of the premier rig builders and pedal designer and builders in the world. We are so happy to be here. Today we are sitting down with Greg Walton, who is the founder and owner of Exact Tone Solutions, and we're gonna get the whole story. So welcome, Greg. Good. It's great to be here this morning. Good. So let, let's start with what got you into you know messing with electronics enough that you would even want to think about pedals and, and rig building and all that jazz? Well, first of all, it started out with like a love for the instrument, a love for guitar. From the time I was you know, eight, 10 years old, I didn't play guitar, but I was infatuated with you know, Eric Clapton and the blues players and the Rolling Stones. And, and I had uh, uncles that were playing the, the records of the day that uh, kind of got me interested in, in that music. So love for the guitar, kind of an infatuation with it, and then becoming a guitar player later on in life is really what spurred me on to, uh, to at what one point, try to get the best tones that I could get out of my gear as far as, and then also helping other people get that out of their gear. So love for the instrument is where it started. But did some of it start with maybe having to fix something yourself or modifying something yourself? How did it you know, kind of germinate? Well, I, w I was doing uh, pedal boards and rigs for guys in and around the Houston, Austin uh, area. And a lot of pedals just didn't sound great. And at the time there were a number of uh, guys that were doing modifications to pedals. Uh, there was Robert Keeley that was in Oklahoma and, and others that did that. So I started having things modified to tonally meet what the, what the player needed. Mm -hmm. And then after a while, when, when R.G. Keen was another guy that was disseminating information and so forth over the, the internet, so when, when guys got busy and couldn't necessarily deliver in the time frames that I needed, it became clear that I, I needed to learn to do the modifications myself. How could I take a, a screamer to really sound great and feel great and so forth, or a DS1 or you know Boss pedals, Ibanez pedals and so forth. So uh, I started to gather information um, on how to do that. Uh, there was, uh, I think, uh, uh, even Brian Wampler had was publishing stuff. R.J. R.J. Keene was publishing stuff. So I w was self-taught really with all of that electronic stuff. I didn't have a background, uh, but I did have certain friends that taught me how to not be scared of a soldering iron. So once I got over the the fear of soldering, it it became uh, a little more second nature to to do the modifications and then getting the rigs uh, together for for the players. And, and seeing their satisfaction with the end results uh, where they had been struggling for years to keep things working from night to night. In fact, the first 20 minutes of setup was getting the pedal board to work for them or all of their gear to work properly together. Uh, and uh, so getting them to a point that they could just go in and set their pedal board down, plug into the amp, plug the guitar into that, and they were ready to play. Um, there was a lot of satisfaction in that. So that's where messing with the pedals came in. Yeah, so I'm, I'm assuming a lot of these players were, you know, they, they probably had a bag full of pedals and were throwing stuff down using batteries and stuff like that. So this was a whole level of integration where you're, you know, where you're starting to introduce, you know, uh, you know, using power supplies and, or a single power supply and, and, uh, and, and, and putting things in an order that would make sense and trying to deal with noise and, you know. Yeah, w one of the kind of the turning points for me um, uh, was meeting a guitar player in Houston named John Ziegler. Okay. Getting into the playing, I I'd started to go see John play, uh, you know, once or twice a week at, at some point, and he was the first guy that I ever saw using a rack, using Soldano preamps, using, you know, uh, stereo power amps and so forth. So 
that's where I got into starting to think more about uh, what was possible with guitar rigs. And then the other thing was with, with him at the time was he, they had a nice rehearsal studio and a lot of the money he was making playing went back into gear. So he had 100 watt plexi stacks with basket weave cabinets, you know, a 68 super bass head and he had original mid to early 60s Vox AC30s and tweed amps and so forth. So, um, we were able to, I was able to be part of groups at time that would get in and go just listen to things. Uh, John was the first guy that had a Tyler, a James Tyler guitar, uh, a Mike Landau uh, signature guitar. So that was the first time they, they came into my consciousness, the, the James Tyler guitar. So uh, by being, by knowing John and, and, and being invited to a lot of these things where we would you know listen to a bunch of great gear, vintage guitars and so forth, it started to, to really calibrate my ear and I started to build this oral vocabulary that kind of the XTS still uses today. So it's part of uh, something that we use on a daily basis here, or, or when we, especially when we're designing new products or so forth, is, um, is having to, knowing what, that, what a, you know, a Plexi Marshall through a 412 basket weave cabinet on eight sounds like and so forth and having those references. So, um, you know, meeting John and him being so gracious to kind of be a mentor when it, when it came to tone and gear, um, I got a chance to try things that I would never get a chance to try. Um, that, that became a big part of, of learning what sounded right to me and what were the best sounds. And then years later through doing rigs and so forth, I met players like Kenny Cordray, that was the, uh, one of the writers of the song Francine for ZZ Top. Yeah. So that was another kind of learning experience and, and metamorphosis that I went through and, and starting to, to get in with the, a bunch of the guys in Austin that, that knew great tone and were, you know, players, real players that were on a, on a, not only a local scale, but on a global scale, so. Yeah. So you're exposed to all these different, you know, sounds, you know, of, of hearing, you know, the vintage or, or kind of what we would call boutique gear, like the, the Dumble or the train wreck. And also you're hearing more complex setups, you know, these rack setups. So, so how do you get, how did you get into, you know, into building or, or, or building your own racks and, or learning about that aspect? Well, the, the interesting thing is at one point in the early 90s, um, I had, I gig gigged locally, a lot of small, you know, clubs, some dives and so forth. And every gig that I played, I played with a 20 space rack full of stuff. And it was really ridiculous for the clubs that I, that I was playing in to have that much gear and to take up that much floor space. But right. I did it anyway, I persisted at that, you know. Uh, but that really started cluing me into, you know, having the Soldanos and Demeters and Eventide harmonizers and Lexicon reverbs and TC2290 delays and so forth. I knew that that was something that I loved and a direction I wanted to move. So through my friend John Ziegler again, his, his, he moved to LA and I was working with a company at the time that would, uh, that we had some work in, uh, Torrance, uh, we had uh, um, a couple of uh, uh, jobs out there in the LA area. So they would fly me out to LA and what I would do is kind of turn that into a little vacation for Greg. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'd stay another week or so out there and crash on John's couch at his place in Burbank. And then I was able to absorb kind of the LA music scene and one of the, um, one of the people I was able to meet is uh, John was working on and off with Andy Brower at North Hollywood Studio Rentals. Right. So we would go over there frequently and, and housed in that building at that time was Dave Friedman, Rack Systems. Um, and uh, I was able to meet Dave and uh, form a friendship over a period of time and so forth. And uh, so as the years progressed, I would come in at least once a year and spend several, several days or several weeks out there. And at times I would get in and, and uh, Dave Freeman was, was 
very gracious with his time and so forth. So I would end up going, um, and at, at one point he moved a shop from North Hollywood Studio Rentals off, off of Chandler there in North Hollywood. So I would go in and spend days at a time and, and help them work on rigs and kind of trade uh, labor for knowledge. Mm. Uh, and Dave was always really open. Um, and we would work on, I remember one time we were working on, we had like three or four rigs that they were working on for Lincoln Park. And there was a rig that had to get out for Dweezil Zappa. Uh, Christopher Cross had a rig in at the time and Tim Pierce, there was something that, uh, that was being done for him. So I would get in on these things to where I would see what they were doing for these even major touring acts. So um, I learned a lot from watching and listening and helping um, uh, with Dave Friedman at times. So that was, a, that was another turning point. Uh, at least it focused me on, I know I wanna do this someday in a bigger way, bigger than just what I was doing around the Houston area in, in Texas. Um, so I was just looking for the right opportunity to, to take it to the next level. Now I think at this point, let's talk about the fact that you, you split time between here in Nashville and then also in Houston because you run two different businesses. So you have Exact Tone Solutions and then you also have an environmental and safety compliance company. Right, I have a company in Houston called Exact Eldar Solutions, LDAR Solutions, that helps, that focuses on helping com people comply with environmental air law. And um, I've been doing that since the 80s. Something, you know, my, a lot of jobs that I've have, have been around the environmental world. Um, so, uh, in 02, it became clear that I kind of needed to either sink or swim on my own. So I formed this consulting firm. And really what we focus on today is we, uh, we have training programs to help uh, people that are becoming administrators that m maybe don't know the nuts and bolts of, of this particular um, discipline of in the environmental world so I can go in and help them get acclimated to the pitfalls, you know, where they could, uh, where they can be successful and where they could potentially be unsuccessful. So training, and then I also spend a lot of time doing uh, third-party audits. Um, fortunately for my company, there's, uh, there are uh, rules, Texas state rules that require facilities with certain chemicals to be audited once per calendar year by a third party. And I'm one of the third parties that yeah. is able to do that. But what, what that company has allowed me to do is set a schedule that is conducive to, to doing exact tone solutions as well. Without that, you know, without exact elder solutions being in play, um, exact tone solutions, I would not have had time to do that. And, yeah. uh, and would not have time to do it today. And so your other business allowed this business to be, you know, created. Absolutely. And and you created this and you you established Exact Tone Solutions in 2006. And what what caused you to to do that? What you know, to to jump from you're helping out, you know, Dave Friedman, you're learning about builds and then you start another company. Well, um in 06 is when I started, so I started doing pedal modifications right. to get pedals to sound the way I wanted them to sound or, or, and so forth. Um, and at one point it became clear that in almost the same time it took to modify a pedal, I could do one from scratch. And there was enough information online, online that I've learned how to order the parts from Mauser and uh, I found some uh, third parties that did circuit boards and so forth so that I could experiment with um, the recipes for, because everybody was doing about the same three or four pedals. Everybody had a screamer, everybody had this, everybody had that. And it was a matter of coming up with a recipe that, that felt right and sounded right and so forth. And, and, and again, um, I was able to get the pedals to guys that, that once I get them tweaked in, the, I was really fortunate that like right off the bat, it seemed to hit a nerve with, with certain players. So there were a number of Austin players that were, 
that had really great gear that I would take the first few offerings that Exact Tone Solutions had and they would go, oh, this is great and start using them right away and still use them today. Yeah. Um, so it, it went from modifying to you know buying circuit boards and stuff that were already out there and exper experimenting with, uh, with uh, recipes. And then from there, I got help to, um, to get circuit boards done once I figured out what I wanted to do with these different circuits. It went from that to building things from scratch. And they, were, they started out in bare metal boxes with Dymo labels, mm -hmm. like a lot of guys start out with. And I still have clients today that tell me, that tell me they're still looking for some of our, the raw box uh, XTS pedals that were made <laughs> in the, uh, in the you know, uh, early 90s, or, or excuse me, early 2000s and so forth. So, um, so it went from that, uh, and then it, you know, once I started doing more with that, it became clear I needed to get a business license and get a name together for the, I was already doing the environmental thing, so Exact Tone Solutions kind of was born out of, of needing to create a definitive business name and, and business practices with, with that. The pedal uh, uh, fabrication and so forth came into, uh, you know, kind of full gear at that point. And, and there was, one thing I never did was I never had a waiting list and I never took uh, monies before products were done because I was working at my own pace. And the day gig, you know, required a certain amount of attention and focus and, and discipline that couldn't be held to production schedules in the, in the early days. Right. So once the pedals got to a certain point, I still wanted to move forward with doing, you know, systems integration and so forth. Uh, exact Tone Solutions was already formed, but in that time frame, there was uh, I got together with a couple of guys in Los Angeles, and we um, started LA Sound Design. Okay. Uh, and LA Sound Design was started late 2006, and because of it being 15, 1600 miles from Texas and a 24 hour drive, it became clear with my business obligations and family obligations that that wasn't going to work long term. So uh, Dave Phillips, who is now the, uh, who uh, owns uh, LA Sound Design has done an amazing job and created a killer business and has really been uh, crucial to our company being successful with, with the pedal, with the products that we do. Dave's always, he's been there from the inception, um, you know, using our stuff and, and getting it into the hands of LA players. Um, Scott Henderson used uh, the Precision Overdrive in, in the early days. So getting getting the pedals into the hands of guys that are actually out there making music and and so forth. So that's, uh, in early 2007, it became clear that I was probably gonna be more of a hindrance than a help in that business. So I went ahead and, and kind of backed out of that to where I could focus on exact tone solutions and developing more pedal ideas and so forth and, um, and to have no distractions with that. Yeah. So when does the rig building or the systems integration, which sounds a lot better than rig building? <laughs> uh, I thank Barry O'Neill for that, for that, for for coining that phrase, systems integration. Um, so uh, the way that kind of came about is, um, at some point, I kind of bumped my head on what I was able to do, because I was self-taught. In, in doing the pedal stuff that I did, it, you know, I couldn't necessarily lay out a PCB and so forth. So it, it, there was a couple of projects that I needed help on. And Dave Phillips at LA Sound Design said, hey, there's some, some guys in, in Thompson Station down south of, of uh, Nashville uh, that have Kingdom amplifiers. And um, they could probably help you move to the next step. So there was a few pedals that I wanted help with. So I went and had a meeting with uh, Kingdom Amplifiers and Barry O'Neill was part of Kingdom Amplifiers at that time. 
And so there was two particular projects that I was really interested in getting their help with and so forth. So we started to, and I think this was probably later, uh, latter 08, 09 timeframe that we first started working together, Barry and I. And then come the, the tail end of uh, 2010, uh, Barry's uh, schedule freed up. It became clear in uh, the latter part of 2010 that uh, Barry O'Neill was available to, uh, for full time, uh, to help me full time. So that's when we decided to uh, open the, the brick and mortar in the greater Berry Hill area here on Winford and you know, do this um, rig building systems integration uh, for real. And, and it wasn't the best time, uh, you know, uh, with the different uh, things that happened with the U.S. economy, 08, 09 timeframe, 2011 was not the best time to start a business. But with Barry and I, it was, it was the right people to do the business. And um, so we went ahead and, and uh, um, went uh, bit off that uh, you know, project. And uh, so we opened XTS, the XTS Custom Shop, in January 2011. So that's when the XTS Custom Shop became um, st um, established here in Nashville, it was 2011. Well, why don't we take a break and we'll bring back Barry and we can talk more. So just how powerful are one-spot power supplies? Well, they're kind of like this. That's power. back and we've brought in Barry O'Neill. Yes. So Barry, tell us a little bit about your background. So you, how did you, how did you be, end up becoming an electrical engineer? Oh, um, my dad actually did a bunch of similar stuff to what we do here. So uh, when, I was a, when I was a younger guy, um, so I grew up around a lot of this stuff. And in fact, I remember in the third grade, uh, actually staying home to stuff circuit boards for custom mixers. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, Mrs. Turk. Um, but I, I didn't go in, stayed home, stuffed, uh, stuffed boards. I, I never knew if that was because my help was actually necessary or if the project was just that far behind that we're looking for, we'll take anybody off the street. But that was a really, that was a really early experience. And then, uh, just kind of being around all the stuff, liking yeah. liking guitar, and uh, and liking the electronics bit of it, um, that came pretty early. And then, so by the time I got into high school and even into college, I was pretty clear on you know that I wanted to do electrical engineering, and you know probably what I want. I mean, to frankly to be able to do something like this was sort of a pipe dream because there's really not that many places that you can, that you can do it. Um, Nashville's a good place to be if you want to try, but uh, you know, if, if I had grown up in you know, where my family's originally from, in eastern Iowa, you know, a, a place like this can't exist up there. Right. But even, even with that being in Nashville, you know, it, it doesn't seem likely that you're going to get 
to have your dream job. So, uh, you know, after, after college, I got my bachelor's and my master's in electrical engineering uh, not far uh, from here and came back from college, started an amplifier company uh, with my family. And, uh, and like Greg was talking about, had a chance to do uh, some contract work for, for XTS then. And when the, when the amplifier company kind of concluded, uh, that kind of, I remember, you know, calling Greg and being like, hey man, like, uh, I don't know what you, you know, I don't know what you've got going on, but I could use some work. And uh, he said, uh, he said, I can probably keep you busy to the end of the year. And that was in 2010. So uh, he's, this company's kept uh, us busy uh, for, for quite a bit longer now. So, uh, but yeah, that was, the, it was pretty darn early that, that I kind of knew what I wanted, what, what I felt like I had, you know, some capacity to do. And then, like I said, this, being able to do this sort of thing in this way uh, was kind of, would be more than I had hoped for. Yeah. So you all know, were designing, you know, some of these, you know, pedals that, mm-hmm. that you have here, like the, you know, of course, some of the early, early ones, like yeah, the, precision. the precision drive mm-hmm. and, and then, you know, the atomic overdrive and then uh, later ones like the Winford or this, uh, you know, shape charger. Mm-hmm. And, but how did you get into the, the rig builds? What were the first rig builds that you did? Uh, the f- for exact tone. Yeah, for exact tone. Well, the the brig building thing. I mean, I was in high school doing that, doing that sort of thing for friends, um, and kind of cutting my teeth on figuring out what worked and what didn't work. Like I said, my dad did this sort of thing. So, yeah, when I grew, go ahead. Was your dad doing that for professionals? Yeah, or? yeah. So for like the Nashville natives, uh, Sam's music. Uh, which yes. had has moved around, but you know, for for the greater part of my recollection, was in the in the Cool Springs area, and uh, O'Neill Custom was actually an adjunct, the adjunct repair shop for that. So anything that Sam's had coming in, and then uh, my dad did a bunch of custom work for a, a bunch of players in town. Um, he wound up moving on to go do uh, other things, and uh, you know, when I was in the eighth grade or so. And uh, so, so that's when I was, the funny thing is, is I never had a, a pedal until I was in college. It was all rack gear. That's what I grew up around. I, you know, I, I grew up with sort of the misconception of like, well, why would I want a dirt box? Like I've got, I've got an 88 MP1. Like that's all got all the dirt sounds that I need in it right there. <laughs> Which for for the kids that aren't familiar that's right. with an ADA MP1. Well, is. That's right. Like that's 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 a dirt box with a tube in it that's like this big and goes and goes in a in a 19 inch format yes. rack and is is uh, was was the bastion of you know of such legendary players as all your favorite 80s hair metal bands. Yeah. Uh, so that's. That was my world for guitar. Mm-hmm. Was racks and stuff like that. Again, this is the this is the slave labor deal uh, of being a little kid around this stuff. I remember cutting heat shrink to put over quarter inch barrels for l- labels, and you know, and and driving rack screws into uh, into washers so they would have insulated rack screws and getting paid like pennies per screw. Uh, to get all that done and put them in bags and stuff. So, this this goes way back, way so back for you, me. You have this in your blood. Yes, as close as close as you can, <laughs> and I've got I've got the scars for it. I mean, I remember, I remember tinning wires for something, and I'm too young to be holding a soldering iron, and like going to clean going to clean the solder, and instead of like flicking it on the down, flicked it on the up. Uh-huh. And it flew up into the air, this big blob of solder, and then landed on my hand, and just completely coming unhinged. Uh, you know, this was a this is a happy childhood that I that I had. So yeah, this and, this and goes way you, back. And yet you dreamed of this. That's right. Yes. That's right. I, I never clarified it was a nightmare or yes. like a dream, but yes, yes. But yes. it was a dr- it, it was a, it was something that was happening at night while I was sleeping. Yes. Yeah. So. Again, going back, you were you were uh, developing these pedals, you know, with with Greg, mm-hmm. and then what was the first, you know, when when did you get? And again, I love the term systems integration. Right, that right. sounds that sound, so much yeah. better than rig building. All right, you can put it on a business card, and your mom yes. won't be like, exactly. "You don't have a real job." Yeah, <laughs> but systems integration, it sounds impressive. That's right. That's yes. right. 
again, that's what you get with a master's degree. And that's, that's, yeah, that's I the, hope the, so. Yes, I yes, the way to put that on there yes, too, I guess. Yes. So, what was the first? When did you start? You know, uh, systems doing systems right, integrations. Right. With so, Exacto. like doing that in a professional way. Probably my big break, and it was just before I came on with XTS proper. Was we had a big flood here in Nashville, and a yes. lot of stuff got destroyed, mm-hmm. and uh, and I got a call. And uh, I'm sitting here realizing I probably owe my entire career to Dave Phillips now because uh, after the flood, uh, the Keith Urban camp uh, and uh, their represent, you know, Keith Tech uh, is, uh, is, is Chris Miller. And he starts calling around because they've, they've been completely washed out. Everything's been destroyed. Um, all their gear has been soaked. And he's got gigs to do. Mm-hmm. So he starts calling around. Well, everybody's busy because, you know, everybody on the East Coast is busy. Everybody on the West Coast is busy because everybody is trying to make up for for everything getting destroyed. And so uh, he called a couple people on the West Coast. And I think uh, the first guy called, sent him to Phillips. And then Phillips was like, I'm too busy to do it. I can't do it. So he calls this, uh, you know, this kid down in Thompson Station and says, hey, you know, I heard, you know, I heard from Dave Phillips, you know, you, you guys might be able to do this and, uh, and we need to get this done in this incredibly tight time frame. And, you know, Chris doesn't, a lot of the people we work for on the higher end, they don't really need us. They could do it themselves. But, you know, in that particular case where you're having to deal with so much. Right. Because, you know, you're, you're going through insurance for, for all, these in, all these instruments, going through your inventory and all this. This is a colossal job. It, it, it's a nightmare. Yeah. So I, you know, one, of my, one of my friends, Chad Weaver, was working for Brad Paisley at that point. Mm-hmm. And so he, he's having to format everything because all of a sudden he's having to replace all the amplifiers. He, he's having to replace all the guitars. You're having to get tubes and strings. You're having to farm out, you know, rigs being built, and so you're doing doing as much farming out as you can. Mm-hmm. Yes, because you don't have the time because there's tour dates that are, you know, on the schedule that are coming up in a, in a couple of weeks, and yeah. you've got to get and, everything ready. In fact, I think I think it was the reason Dave Phillips referred Chris to you was because Dave was doing Brad Paisley's he was rigs on a fly rack. T- yeah, for, for, Paisley, for Brad Paisley. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so I got that call, and then, you know, Chris, I mean, you've been there where you're, you're having to work with a vendor, and you're like, I don't even know if you can really do this. I just got a phone call from one guy who says you might be able to do it. Right. And, uh, and Miller was like, well, you know, can I come down there to your shop? I'm sure just to, like, see, like, is this legit at all? And I remember at one point he even sort of, like, uh, you know, apologized. Like, man, he goes, I'm sorry. He goes, like, I just don't know you. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And I was like, well, come, come down and, uh, you know, we'll get things cleaned up so we look as legit as possible. And uh, I, guess, I guess the meeting went okay because he left saying, okay, we're going we're gonna to do this. And, uh, and we did. It was, you know, it was an 80-hour week to get it done. I think, uh, I think Keith was going out to do uh, some stuff with the Eagles right after that. And, uh, and it, was a tough, it was a tough job. My, one of my daughters, uh, my second daughter, I think turned one or two at the time. I can't remember the years. And I remember leaving the shop, going and saying happy birthday, kiss on the head, going back to the shop to try to get this done. It was, it was a big deal. And two, I mean, you want to do good, right? And, right. And, uh, and also in that moment, you're realizing, okay, this is a big deal. Like if, if we blow this, then there won't be any more. So you better get this right, and you better get it done. It better be on time. There better be no problems because your 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 first. We'd done other things before. Nothing of that size. This was a this is a 40 RU rack filled with stuff, mm-hmm. and uh, and it was like if we don't get this right, the first one may be the last one. So it was it was a big it was a big deal, and that was sort of trial by fire, first foray into big stuff and and that just kind of snowballed from there so then you you went full-time with uh with greg that's right in 2011 january of 2011 yeah early early 2011 we did some contract work towards the end of 2010 yeah getting kind of ducks in a row and then greg and i you know i remember sitting in our apartment at the time just kind of 
even kind of hoping, like, well, maybe, again, this goes back to, like, that dare to dream, like, it would be cool if, and I remember thinking, like, it would be great if, if I didn't have to go get a real job and, you know, design stuff that didn't interest me or I didn't find sort of viscerally exciting. And, you know, maybe, maybe I can get, and it's because it's a bit, and realizing this is going to be a big deal for Greg. He's in Houston and he's going to start a shop. He and I know one another, but not, not anywhere like we know one another now. And like, is he going to trust, I don't know how, I, mean, I don't know how old I would have been then, but uh, it would have been, you know, sub thirties. It was this, nine years ago. Yeah. So it would, is he going to trust this kid to, to sit in this building and sort of justify all of its costs and all that. So it was a big, it was a big kind of hope, uh, but just sitting there talking like, oh, I, I think we can do this. And I, you know, I think this is, this is an ideal time to get it, to get it started. And there was some kind of sacrifices made on both sides to, to make it happen. Um, but yeah, that's when that, that's when that started. So let's just, you know, kind of throw out names of people that you've been, you know, building rigs for. I know you've got you've got a, a pedal board that you're building for Tom Bukovac right now on the mm -hmm. bench, but yeah. let's let's go through and let's just, you know, just name names. Oh, uh, naming names is always tough because you always leave somebody off. Well, since since I since I'm very good at dropping names, <laughs> uh, just uh, funny story. I got when I went back to Houston on my last trip in, uh, I got pulled over by one of uh, Tennessee's finest. And a uh, very nice guy. Uh, he just kind of wanted me to, to slow down a little bit and pay, atten pay more attention and so forth. But he asked me several questions like, what are you doing in Nashville? I said, I own a business there. What do you do? We do, we build rigs for uh, session musicians and touring musicians. And he goes, well, who are your biggest clients? And I said, uh, Keith Urban, Carrie Underwood, Taylor Swift. He goes, never heard of them. So, but we've done rigs like uh, we were fortunate enough to do uh, the pedal board for Peter Frampton as he was going to do the 50th anniversary of the Beatles mm -hmm. being on Ed Sullivan. We got a chance to do that. And Ryan Bullington, our friend that uh, I think he's working with Jimmy Buffett's camp right now, he's the one that kind of turned us on to that. Um, Tom Bukovac, Jed Hughes. Uh, I mean, there's just, I mean, we're, Derek, when you start mentioning yeah, names, yeah. Derek, Derek Wells, Wells yeah. Ron McNelly, Kenny yeah. Greenberg, Christopher, Christopher Cross. Yeah, we're so fortunate at this point that particularly in the Nashville area, it used to be when we started this, nobody knew who we were. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, and after a period of time, you might have a friend who has a friend who knows who we are. And then that got to everybody has a friend who knows, you know, who we are. And then eventually, you know, sometime in the next 30 years, we'll be to where at least everybody knows, has at least heard of us. But we, it's an embarrassment of riches for us because, you know, we talk about this on a regular basis. A disproportionate amount of our clientele on both the pedal side and the, and the rig building side puts money or puts food on the table with with playing guitar. So we've got a lot of professional players and probably, prob I would guess prob that ratio for us is probably pretty high compared to, to other folks. So to have access to these folks, to see the gear that they're using, to help them make that work for them um, is, a, is a huge deal. You know, because we work with the session guys, when the, when the road dogs come in and, and need stuff, we know what went on the records that that they're trying to cop the sounds from. So that's that's helpful. Sort of having that sort of vertically integrated uh, is a big deal. So my one of the th things that I, I like to do now is watch the uh, re the award shows and know like right now we're approaching a hundred percent of everybody who's on that show. Not that we're working for the person on the ticket. Yeah. But there's some guy out there who's who's either playing guitar or we've done something for the production in one way or the other to where we've been able to facilitate in some way the things that they want to do. That That's always sort of a heartwarming thing for me to see that kind of grow in percentage every I mean, year. That, that's quite the accomplishment. People will watch an award show and you've worked with, you know, you've got stuff that most of the acts on the show are using. Yeah, yeah. We're, we consider ourselves fortunate, for sure. Yeah. But, I mean... As uh, recently, 
Um, we did some work for um, Tyler Bryant mm -hmm. and Graham Whitford of Tyler Bryant in the Shakedown. And the reason they came to us is Tyler had a meeting with, or was talking with Derek Wells or had dinner with Derek and was talking about his rig and this and that. And Derek did the referral to us. So that just happened, you know, within the last couple of months. So that's still today, word of mouth, uh, there's still people learning about us for the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, uh, we get a lot of referrals and that's... that's yeah, we, that's we live thing. and die by that sort of thing, which is why we fight so hard to have everything go out as perfect as it can be, because the only way you're going to tell somebody about it uh, is, is if it's excellent. You can't walk out of here being like, well, I didn't really get what I wanted. Yeah. It needs to be something that you're telling all your buddies about, all your, your crewmates about, and, uh, and getting people excited about it, because we need it, all those folks to come in. So again, these rigs, they can be as simple as small, you know, fly mm -hmm. pedal boards that, you know, of course now in, in this day and age, you know, people have multiple rigs mm -hmm. and they have multiple boards. So you might build a, a simple fly rig for someone. You, they might have an around the town. They have a session board. Then you have some of your touring acts where you are integrating amp heads and switching and effects and all sorts of other things. Mm -hmm. or where you have someone like Taylor Swift or Carrie Underwood, where they're you know they're not using live amps, they're mm -hmm. using uh, either you know fractals or, or whatever else, sure. and you're integrating those all in in racks. So I mean, these these can be very complex systems. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Pardon me. That and these complex systems are having to integrate with uh, you know time codes and other things. Right. And yeah, that's that's the tricky bit. Right, right now. Like the pedal board thing, that's we know enough about that. We've done enough of those that that's kind of a lock. Like somebody can bring in a basket case of pedals, and we know we can apply our best practices and the things that we've learned. We we know when we put that together, it's going to be super quiet. It's going to be tone full. It'll be it'll work perfectly. It'll work for a long time. It's those rigs that you're talking about, and and really, I think philosophically, the thing that separates those big jobs from the, from the smaller ones as far as scope um, is how they interface into other things in production. So if, are they talking, so like those big rigs that you're talking about, they talk to the playback system, they're getting cues from playback, they're, uh, they're, they're getting the time code that you're talking about, mm -hmm. uh, they're, getting, uh, they're connected to RF world. Uh, for their wireless packs. They're connected to monitor world for all this stuff. The techs have certain requirements that they have. So you've got these rigs that instead of just having one line to an amp on back line that's completely isolated from everything because it's got a microphone in front of it, these rigs just sort of spider out right. into like five different departments. And you, in some ways, your the guitar player's needs, they're not, they're not it's not unimportant but there's a lot of other things competing for, uh, for attention in those builds. And it sounding good is, is one of the things that's important, but, it's, but it, it's not the only thing. Right. Yeah. It's about it continuing to function and function at the right point and to change patches at the right point yeah. and not cause noise. And I mean, packaging yeah. is a huge deal these days because, uh, you know, like you're saying, people do multiple boards because they need to do a flyboard. We just did that for Tyler Bryant. We built him a big board that's great for their day in, day out uh, touring work, but it's it's too heavy to fly without getting hit on an overage. Now, a guy who plays like that doesn't need much to, to do a show. He has what he has to make his life easier and to make the show that much better, but he can get away with just a couple things. So for his fly rig, you know, we take take his board, we'll, we'll, uh, he wants to do international with it, so we'll use like uh, your guys' CS6 supply on it so that he can do international, so that he can fly over to Europe and Japan, wherever they're going, and just plug in locally and not have to deal with step-down transformers or anything like that, and just build him something different that meets those needs. And so packaging is a huge, is a huge deal for those larger rigs. Uh, just recently, we've done uh, revamps for some very large rigs because they were too big, and they can't they can't fit into the festival shows that they want to fit into because they've got eight cases of guitar stuff. So we got to collapse, re kind of repackage things. So 
I mean, everybody's trying to serve somebody else. And so figuring out what they need to do to be able to do what they need to do informs what we're doing for them. So I'm just going to do a blatant, you know, product plug because, you know, one of the ways, you know, we met was that you started using True Tone power supplies. And I remember mm -hmm. you getting one and hearing back that you had, you know, done all sorts of testing on it and such. And then, and then you started using these in your builds. And we were, of course, very happy, you know, with, with that. And then we started seeing these on pros, you know, pedal boards and started seeing photos and stuff. And we were just blown away by seeing that happen. And so thank you. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, you know, Barry. No, it's, it's our pleasure. And I mean, you, I remember now, I kind of forgotten what you said, but I remember sort of trying to break it when we got it. Because we're very reticent to recommend things. We try to maintain sort of an editorial objectivity. And there's a few, there's a few things out there, in fact, their supplies, their power supplies, where we, we don't tell people what to do. I mean, if you want to use something, we'll do our best to make it work as good as it can. But there's even certain supplies um, out there where we'd be like, no, you probably don't want to do that. Or if you do that, it's going to cost you in this way. You know, you know it's going to be maybe higher noise or we're going to have to spend more labor time fussing with it, trying to get everything configured the way that you're going to need it for, for things to be quiet. And uh, so we take, we take that responsibility pretty seriously. And with any new product, everybody's sort of hesitant. And so even I remember with those, with the True Tone supplies, people asking like, okay, is this, is this cool? Like I know the one spot, like I know that thing, um, but like can, like is this legit? Like is this cool? Yeah. And, uh, and we're like, yeah, and we need to be able to say yes or no. And, and, and if we're going to, we buy them just like anybody else and, and resell them when we have the opportunity to. Um, so we're kind of putting our name on it as well, saying this is okay, this is cool, you can use this. That's a responsibility that we don't, that we don't take lightly, for sure. And when we first got into using them, again, you, you know, we tried very hard to figure out what they're what the, the, the limitations were. Like where, remember we very act one down to like under 60 volts. Mm -hmm. And the one thing about power supplies, when they fail to get them to come back up, you know, we unplug them, plug them back in to see if they would come up. And we really couldn't get it to fail. And we were, we were using, it, we, it, we had to get ridiculous with, with uh, the voltage that we were running it down to, to even to get it to, to cut off. And the other thing that, that we like to do is power things in maybe not the most conventional ways. Uh, most guys wouldn't think to power uh, certain things the, the way that we do. So we had to test it to make sure that those products were going to power right, even at different uh, voltage levels and so forth. Because you get on these festivals and you don't know what the what you're going to be getting to your pedal board or your amps or whatever. So yeah, so knowing those edge cases is a big deal. And then, and then too, we we recommend whatever the rig needs. There's been there's been uh, plenty of times where the the supply that was right, um, you know, wasn't a True Tone and it wasn't it wasn't a Strymon, it wasn't a Voodoo Lab, but something you know maybe something else. Um, but I I can say. You know, we've been using a lot of True Tone supplies, and, and the fact that they're as flexible as they are um, is is a big deal for us, for sure. Yeah. Well, again, thank you. So, let's say I contact you and say, "Hey, I want you to build a pedal board for me." What does that process look like? Like, take us through the the steps of you know someone contacting and said, "Hey, I want you to build me a pedal board. I'm out on the road, you sure. know, playing with someone, and I want it to be bulletproof." Sure. It usually starts like an email or a phone call. Um, you know, pricing's a big deal. Everybody's trying to, uh, you know, make a living out of it, and you can't go spending half of what you make on your on the stuff that's at your feet. So what we try to do is really quickly assess what somebody's needs are. So you can we if you email us or call us, we'll eventually send you like a work order. It's a really easy way to kind of list all the stuff that you want to do, uh, all the stuff that you have, what you want to do with it. Uh, it lets us know what we need to secure for you. 
and then uh, and then we'll turn that into a quote. There's usually some back and forth. You know, have you thought about this or you know, you could use some interfacing. We do a lot of custom interfaces here, so that would be a box that where you you're plugging in your guitar and and uh, plugging in your amp, and maybe it's got some special features like it does stereo with an isolation transformer, or maybe it's got an insert for the pedal of the day and stuff like right. that. So you may or may not have considered those things. So if there's anything we can do to, it's all custom. It can be whatever you need it to be. Uh, so if we pitch some stuff to you that you're like, oh yeah, that would make good. I could use I could use that, and then you know we can get that integrated in, and the board's that much the board's that much better. So we'll turn that into a quote. We're pretty good at sticking with our quotes. We're usually like plus or minus ten percent unless something really goes haywire, uh, you know. But the player would be aware of that uh, as they and have approval of that as they go on. Um, but uh, so then we got to get the stuff in. So whether you're bringing in a board where you're you're just suspicious of all the cabling on it and you'd like to go with something, some custom cut and soldered cables, we've done that. Uh, if, if, uh, if you need us to build you the actual physical pedal board, we can do that here uh, because the, that next step is bringing stuff in and physically getting it laid out. Uh, that layout thing is, is uh, you know, there's, there's lots of places where you can make things better there because you want to prioritize certain things. Like you may you may have like a solo boost, a little boost pedal, and you may only step on it three times in a set, but when you want it, you want it right now and you need to make sure that it's in a place that you can that you can get it. So as you know, those frequent things that you use, you probably want forward on the board and to your strong side, whether you're right footed or left footed. So that boost may be in a place that sort of belies how infrequently you use it, but, but it's prioritized because when you need it, you need it now. So we'll get that layout stuff figured out and, uh, and client will approve that. And then we start cutting cable. Everything we do here is soldered and, uh, and we custom cut to length so you don't have a bunch of extra cable for both aesthetic and you know electronic reasons. Um, and then uh, we'll go through that. That'll be done. Eric, our tech here, who does a line share, that nitty gritty building stuff. Once that board is complete, uh, we'll do a test. And you know, Eric's a great guitar player, and uh, and he will he will test a rig like a guitar player. So we're gonna you know, previous to even getting things mounted on the board, we're going through them and testing them all, making sure everything's tight. You know, foot switches are working properly, so that once we get the the board together we're going through and testing each pedal. Is this thing functioning? Our, one of our goals is that each pedal, when it's on by itself, should sound like it's on by itself outside of the rig, right? So uh, you're gonna go through and test that. Noise is a big deal uh, for us here. Um, you know, if you want your rig to sound organic or, uh, you know, all the sort of guitar-y, fluffy words that we use for that, uh, noise floor is a big deal. Yes. So uh, when you go to zero, it needs to be as close to zero as possible so that when you hit that string, it's as, it's as explosive and dynamic as it can be. That goes, that goes a huge way to a pedal board sounding like nothing is that noise floor being really low. So that's one thing that we're, we're really persnickety about. And, uh, and then we'll go through and shake everything down mechanically uh, as well to make sure that uh, everything's solid before giving it over the customer. And then uh, we'll do uh, heat soaking as well. Uh, we call it just leave the board on, everything running full power, so that if something's going to fade or if uh, if a power supply is going to going to complain at all, that it happens here because we don't want it to happen right. you know, out there. Uh, so that's and then customer comes in, um, says it's great, and uh, and they go make money with it. Yeah. What What do you wish that people knew? that your customers knew before they came in, like, you know, when they're having a pedal board or a rig built, what are some things that you would like to impart? Hmm. You know, there's not a lot you have to know. Uh, we've, had, we've had guys call in with lists of songs on records. Like, these are the sounds that I want. I don't know what pedals to get. Wow. I don't know what to do. I have a guitar that I like. I think this is the amp I'd like to use. Do you think I need another, should another amp be better? So we're fortunate that some of our clients call and they're like, 
I, I just want to know what I want to sound like. Can you, can you guys help? Wow. Let's get there. That's a whole nother level of, of helping them, you know, get to their goal of like, of knowing, you know, sonically, these are what pedals, amps and such that you would need to get to your goal. By, by yeah. I mean, that kind of goes album, into what Greg was talking about. Yeah. Just that, that history of hearing stuff and knowing what, what stuff is what. That oral vocabulary that right. you have from, from this, uh, you know, again, Eric Newcomer, uh, being a great guitar player, having played as much as he has, he has and had to learn as many different styles and so forth as he's had to learn. Um, a lot of times, especially with the one where we had to pick so sounds off of records and then pick the gear that it took to do that. And we have a network of friends that you call them up. What did uh, Eddie Van Halen use on you know the 1988 record you know that is such and such and for and they, some of them we call them what did you use on this record yeah because you can add, you can call up Derek Wells and mm -hmm. you can say yeah. okay what did you use on this Marin Morris album mm -hmm. or, or mm -hmm. what have you yeah. for sure I think you know one of the lessons learned from you know doing this for nine years here is that um, at times we'll have like a young player get his first real gig, right? He's going out with an artist. Um, he's he's gonna have a tech for the first time. You know, there's a, there's a real crew, um, so he's excited about that. He wants to make sure that he can get all the sounds he wants to get. So you end up getting a pedal board, or their first shot is you know they're gonna have a 40 by 20 pedal board with all the gadgets they think they want on there. Right. And, and because they're gonna have the crew and so forth and it's going in a truck, it's not gonna, there's not weight limits to that kind of, uh, uh, in that situation. But once they do a few shows and they realize that this is just way too much stuff. It's true, I can get everything I want and every sound I've ever imagined that I wanted, I can get. Um, it's still, when they go to play the Grand Ole Opry and they have to take that pedal board on the Opry for two songs and <laughs> and it looks, even they at that point go, oh, this is, this is way too much. Yeah, you feel like a heel. Right, so one of the things that we try to do when we get, again, now young players coming in and this is their first real board and their first real gig and so forth, is boiling down the board to the meat and potatoes. Right, I need this overdrive, I need this compressor, I need this delay. And then through the kind of the heart of all of our rigs are the interfaces. Um, as Barry said earlier, you know, we can do interfaces as simple or as complex as needed. But um, so let's say somebody needs to, to run their time-based stuff to the loop of an amp. Well, we can put that loop in there. When you're not plugged into it, everything goes to the face of the amp. When you're plugged into that loop, then the time-based stuff goes to the, the effects loop of an amp. So we can make those interfaces as complicated as, as needed and sometimes, you know, putting ground lifts on them and phase reversal and so forth. We've had people play in like the, the, the night uh, talk shows and, um, and realize that that phase reversal switch saved, their, saved them an hour of time. Right. Or that ground lift saved somebody within that, that, that particular filming of that television show saved them a lot of time, which which endears that player to those technical people because they love it when they can flip a switch and then an hour worth of work goes away. But um, one of the things we can do is do their bread and butter board. And again, take in all of the, the size and weight constraints that's needed. And then if they need a gag board, the, the board that's gonna have the whammy on it that they use once every six months or a particular delay that they don't use, but when they do sessions. We can do a satellite board that interfaces with their bread and butter board, and then they have everything that they need. Right. But the we try to steer people away from, um, they can do whatever they want. And, and we're, we encourage the biggest boards they want. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we also kind of, like to spend their money the way that we would like to spend our money, the, the lowest cost, the biggest bang for the buck, um, and, and so forth. So that's the way that we look at it. So yeah. having people keep things manageable 
is, is really one of the keys to, to... Yeah, we understand the motivation too, right? Like you're gonna, you're gonna go to XTS and you're gonna get your dream board made. You better make sure it has everything that you ever wanted on it. You know, it's gotta be a studio board, it's gotta be a live board. I, I wanna be able to, and it has to be under 50 pounds because I wanna be able to fly it because someday in the future I might fly it. Um, and you and the board winds up serving so many masters that it doesn't really do it doesn't it doesn't suit any sort of venue well uh, at all. So we keep a pretty light touch on our opinions. Like if if somebody comes in and is dead set on doing something, we'll we'll do it. There's there's not much that we that we haven't done for players, and uh, and in addition to that, there's not much that we can't figure out. If you, if you wanna be able to do something, we can make it happen. The only time we'll make suggestions, and that's something that we learned, because um, you know, we've, we've helped people build these big giant boards, and, and now if we were to have those same scenarios come in, we would just say, have you considered this? And, uh, and if they're like, yeah, I have, and then cool, like, let's, let's do what you wanna do. And, uh, but a lot of times it winds up being like, well, no, I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that. Uh, and so we're here, it's a service industry, and we're, we're very aware that these are not our pedal boards, and uh, you know, techs have to take care of them, players have to play them, uh, these are the people that have to, to live with them, so they can't all leave here suiting our preferences, so our preferences are definitely subject to, uh, to what our clients wanna do. Yeah. On the on other True Tone Lounge episodes, there have been many exact tone boards. And so I've seen an, a number of the different interface boxes that you've made. And mm -hmm. some of them are, are simple in that maybe they have an insert for a volume pedal or an insert where you can put another pedal. Mm -hmm. Some will have like a power tap off it. I've seen you know more complex ones that have a section for running uh, acoustic guitar and electric guitar that's completely isolated. Seen where they've where you have a mono or stereo outputs using you know the the real stereo outputs and mm -hmm. just all sorts of you know there yeah that's kind of the 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 heart of of these custom boxes that you make yeah. for these rigs or the interfaces. Yeah, and we don't have canned ones. I mean, we've talked about making like some for stock. But one of the benefits is, is that whatever you need as a player, you get to have. Right. And I don't make any other player pay for what you want that he or she doesn't want. And so we're, we have the capability of just making, since everything's custom, then whatever you're thinking of, we can do. Whatever problems you have. You know, and, and utility guys are because their rigs, again, they're one of those spider rigs, they mm. go right to Audio World, and Audio World can do something to fix a problem that they're having, and because you're connected to them very directly, it breaks you. So we've had, um, uh, like Dan Hochalter, who uh, plays a utility position for Dirks Bentley, we, one of the biggest interfaces we've ever done is for, pedal board interfaces we've ever done is for him, and every output is isolated and, and uh, has lifts, and his wireless inputs are isolated and have lifts, and nobody on the deck has to really know how this box functions. They just flick switches until it's quiet. Right. And so there's a, there's a level of sort of, if we can just get this sorted out for you, and now instead of tearing their hair out, and, and it was it was running the tech ragged because they would go and they'd do line check and and it was good yesterday. Right. But Monitor World had to adjust something on their end and it screwed up their ground scheme. Right. And then now there's a, a state change that needs to happen. Because there's a there's a ground lift. There's a buzz that wasn't there before. Sure. Yeah. And I've I've seen that happen so many times in the in the past and in, in my road days where you saw especially guys that were you know had you know were playing multi, you know, mm -hmm. they were the multi-instrumentalist. Yes, they always had the problems because they had, you know, multiple direct boxes and in, in these these rigs that were they were trying to use the same pedals or, or effects sure. or things with different direct boxes and going to different things is it's a complex setup and uh, yeah. something that's that's a uh, amazing to have, you know, the you know, the the ground lifts and isolation transformers so that everything is just you know, flick of a switch and, and you can, all of a sudden the noise went away. Yeah, and that sort of service thing is a huge deal because now those guys are free. 
how much better can a tech do his job if he hasn't spent every second up to stage, you know, trying to sort out something that's gone wrong? Right. And how much better is a is a player going to be able to play if he knows if he or she knows that that rig is going to perform flawlessly? And when you go to step on something where there's not even an inkling in your mind, well, is this going to work tonight? That makes all those all those things add up to feeling better about it and feeling more free. And then you sound better because you're freer to sound better. You can focus on what you focus on. So there's a lot especially for our national clients who are here local uh, to us and have you know, access to us uh, more so than our, our clients that are kind of uh, out, out in other places in the world. Like you're, when, you, when you get a rig done by us, like you're, we're on your team. If you go out and do a weekend of shows and, and you're like, I think I might have an issue or the, the audio guy, we were, the front of house guy we were working with, you know, he thought that there might be an issue, we'll bring the board in, we'll check it out. Yeah. And we know these boards are a big investment up front. We don't nickel and dime guys for, for stuff like that after the fact. Um, you know, we often tell guys once we finish a board, it's like this is, the, this is the last time you should have to mess with this. That's not to say that nothing ever goes wrong, but should it, it won't be your problem, not for long. So that's, our, that's one of our goals. And, and locally, we, we've, I mean, I think Derek Wells is even a couple of times as has called us and he'll be in the studio and I think somebody stepped on a cable that goes to my uh, input box. Um, you know, something's not happy. Uh, so we locally, we can even make house calls, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, we've done that, uh, not frequently, but we've done that occasionally and so forth. But um, even with pedal swaps, uh, the one thing that, uh, you know, a lot of guys change or like to change pedals a lot uh, for those guys, just bring the board in. If you need a pedals changed out, even if it's just for a couple of days, we can do that for you because it typically takes four, five, ten minutes max. Mm -hmm. Then it doesn't cost them anything. We can swap it out, make sure everything's happy. You know, you can, you know, take it and 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 with confidence know that it's it's going to perform like the board did when you first picked it up. Yeah. I think one of the things that we realize is that it's an investment up front. You know, uh, like Barry said, and um, I, I know that we had one client one time that um, got a board done and it was an investment for him. And he considered whether or not he wanted to spend the money at the time to do that. And um, after he had used it for several months, um, somebody on the road uh, approached him about how his board looked and sounded. and. And at that point, it worked every time. Uh, the board that he had before that he had kind of done himself, uh, every, every day he was getting it to work. He had to spend some time getting it to work. So uh, when the person asked him ab about that, and they said, uh, who did your board? And he said, Exact Tone Solutions did my board. And they go, well, aren't they expensive? He said, I can't afford for, to not have them do the board. That's, that's how much peace of mind and that's how much uh, reliability those those rigs yeah and the, uh, the service uh, after the fact like the pedal swapping thing it's not totally altruistic because it's good for us to see these boards on a regular basis now we have some clients where we see them beginning of every tour season and the the board comes in it's it's caked in dirt and uh and everything needs going through uh, we'd much we'd much rather see them on a regular basis, keep close tabs on them, and just make sure that you know we're kind of aware of you know kind of where our babies are, are at and what they're doing and what they may need. Right. I, the the one thing that that I'd like to say is that with with Barry being involved and uh, the engineering background that Barry has and the engineering capabilities that Exact Tone Solution has, there's really very few systems integrators uh, out there that can do the things that we do. There's a handful probably in the world that can do some of the rigs that we can do. And that's not being boastful or anything. It's just we, we've had people bring ideas and concepts to us about rigs they wanted. And we were even scratching our heads. Well, can we do this? Or, you know, how do we make this happen? And, and we were able to make them ha happen and make them reliable and so forth. So, um, 
I always say, if you can dream it, we can probably do it. So uh, we've had some special needs clients mm -hmm. that we've done boards for. I, you want to touch on that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we've done boards for uh, quadriplegics. We've done boards for paraplegics. One of the... One of the uh, one of the boards we did early in, in the custom shop was uh, for a, a paraplegic gentleman who's uh, is a, is a really fine guitar player, um, but can't use a pedal board the way that pedal boards are traditionally used. So uh, he found uh, a controller uh, that, uh, I think it was called a guitar wing, uh, that goes on the guitar, and we, inter we took that and translated it into MIDI to control a MIDI controller. So now this guy uh, can, can go out, and I, I believe he actually gigs, and uh, he keeps the pedal board up by his hand for, for sort of... Uh, big changes, but then he's got some presets and stuff on the guitar. And that's we really like helping people. Yeah. Uh, we typically, I know sometimes you hear stories where people call experts or like expert pedal makers or whatever, uh, and you get kind of a spiky person who's like unwilling to share any of the secrets or 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 uh, that. That's just never been our attitude. We're pretty liberal. With, uh, with, with sharing things, because we think ultimately it serves the people. And then uh, additionally, if we can build a, this is a relationship company, we can narrow down kind of all of our Nashville clientele to like one or two guys, like the first guys who came in here and then everything sort of is connected to them. So um, our, our business model is, is based on serving and, and, and helping people. So those, those, Closing the gaps, like every board that comes in has gaps. Whether a guy has songs on a record and he wants to sound like that, that's a big gap from not having any gear to knowing I want to sound like that. And then you've got guys who are like, I've got everything I want. I know how I want to use it, but I can't get it to, to do what I want it to do. And maybe you need a special box that does this special thing that suits only you. We'd love to, we'd love to do that for you because yeah. One, because it's our business, and two, we like seeing guitar players, you know, have the tool set that they need to do the work, uh, to do the work that they want to do. So our engineering facilities and our manufacturing facilities uh, here are uh, pretty critical to, to, our, to the, the, the scope of our offerings, which is pretty broad. I know one of the things that we had, we had talked about earlier is, you know, what, what would you... Um, you know, what would you like guys to know coming in or, you know, what what would we like our clients to know as they come in? They really don't have to know anything, as Barry pointed out. But one of the things that we get a, a, a lot of misconceptions on, and that's where, um, you know, having is the power, how to power everything. There's mm -hmm. a lot of misconceptions on you know, do I run 18 volts to this? Can I, can I, you know, I've got one last port on my power supply. That's 18 volts. Can I, can I use it on this nine volt pedal? Yeah. Uh, so I think one of the things that, um, that we always have to close the gap on, as you said earlier, is the power needs yeah. for boards. Yeah, yeah, that's a big deal. The, one of the things that I'd like to point out as, as kind of as, as we're um, drawing things to a close is that Customer service is is really important to us. Yeah. Um, we want everyone to be very happy with their rigs. When when things when rigs come in, they come in and they go into the queue. Uh, we try very hard not to um, rock star anybody and 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 so forth. Every now and then we have critical things that need to be done, but typically when we take in a project, we know what folks drop dead days dates are. Uh, and we always meet those drop dead dates unless something, you know, um, you know, unless a 500 year flood were to happen or something like that. We, we always meet those deadlines and so forth. But the customer service side of things is, is I, we, we work very hard at it and I, I think that it shows in the industry and so forth. Um, you know, being able to take in a, a, a rig and a guy that's just you know playing for fun or on the weekends or what whatever, he gets the same support 
that a, a an artist would get if we're doing work. So I mean, one of the guys we've worked for from time to time, John Oates, uh, and and a, a guy that's you know a weekend warrior really gets the same attention to the rig and so forth that that an artist would get. So and and we become a part of their team just like we're a part of the the audit the artist team and so forth. Well, you guys have a, a stellar reputation and you've earned it, you know, with the fantastic builds. And I just want to thank you for letting us invade your, <laughs> your office your, uh, and, uh, and, and thank you so much. Well, we're, we're happy to be here and we're happy. We, I am a fan and I think we're a fan of the True Tone Lounge uh, episodes and so forth. I think I've seen every one of them. And, uh, and, and watch them, uh, shall I say, religiously. Uh, but it, they're, they're, they are a, um, they, they're important to us, and to be able to participate is, uh, is, 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 is awesome, so. <laughs> well, thank you, and, and you know, you've been part of so many shows already with, <laughs> you've been present by uh, your builds, so I'm glad that we were finally able to, uh, to have you uh, on the show. So thank you again. Thanks, thank Zach. you. All right.